Hey everybody, uh, we are going to be talking about chapter 11 and sentencing. So now that we've gone through the entire trial process, this part is only for those who have been found guilty or take a plea bargain. So this will affect only those people that are in the system once a trial is completely done. Or like I said, if you take a plea bargain uh, and plead guilty, then you can be uh, sentenced prior to a trial or without a trial. So there's two main parts that I want to talk to you about as far as sentencing is concerned. And the first part of that is what is our goals and purposes of sentencing? We have five areas that we look at. Retribution, incapacitation, deterrence, which actually has a couple of different parts to it, which we'll talk about as we look into it further. Rehabilitation and restoration. So let's look at retribution, which is, in a lot of people's mind, the very first reason that we have sentencing. The idea here is that the person that committed the crime is going to be punished. It's a way for kind of the revenge factor in our society. The prosecution prosecutes and attempts to get a conviction to give the victim some sort of peace um, and possible payback, in a sense. That would be the first idea of our criminal justice system and why we have the punishments that we have. The second part of our sentencing is incapacitation. So along with giving them a sentence to enact some sort of revenge, what does that look like? In our society over the years, we've had a lot of attitude of kind of lock them up and throw away the key approach. We see that with some of the laws that we have and some of the long sentences that people get for nonviolent crimes. And this has turned into what we consider warehousing. We literally have buildings that are overcrowded and overpacked with people who are not necessarily your serial killers or mass murderers. Many of them are potentially nonviolent crimes and could possibly have had a different type of sentencing imposed. But since majority of the time our laws do not allow for that, as we will see in the second part of this chapter, we have to look at what do we do when somebody is sentenced? You're sentenced to prison and why? So you've committed a crime, you are paying your dues for that, and part of that is incapacitating you and taking you out of society to hopefully teach you a lesson. The next part to this is kind of twofold. One, it's for society, and the other part is for the offender. So this is called deterrence. And deterrence seeks to inhibit criminal behavior by fear of punishment. What this is, is the what we call specific deterrence means we're going to send you to five years for your crime and we hope that that is enough time for you to figure out that you should never do this again. The opposite part of this is the general deterrence, which is telling society, hey, we're going to sentence you to five years for this crime if you commit it. So we're telling you that now, so don't be surprised if you get caught and you get five years. But maybe think about, before doing that crime, what are the consequences? And hopefully we can deter you ahead of time. Many times by using a person as an example, when we see how many people are already behind bars. The idea is good, but as you can tell, much of it is ignored by the over crowdingness of our prison system. Another goal that unfortunately lacks severely in our system is rehabilitation. Part of the goal of not only just locking somebody up and making them understand their consequences, but also getting them to change their mindset, learn to do something better and different when they get out of the prisons and jails, and hopefully put them on more of a path to get out of the system. Unfortunately, we lack severely in this area in our criminal justice system. This is one of those areas that reform is greatly, greatly, greatly needed. 
the last part of the goals of sentencing is to re restore everyone back to what we consider whole. This involves not necessarily always the offender or just the offender, but the victim. Society has to be able to help the victim get back to as much of a normal life as possible. And depending on the crime, that's not going to be a complete 100% thing. But there are many times where victims can definitely get back to a much more normal life, especially if somebody is locked up and they know that they cannot be hurt by that person again. However, we also know that majority of crimes do not carry a life sentence and they do not carry necessarily a really long sentence. So therefore, we actually have to be able to help the victim get restored back to themselves as much as possible while allowing for hopefully rehabilitation to take place with the offender and being able to get them back into society and make them a productive person versus a hurtful person. And we will talk more about this when we get into uh, chapters 12 through 14 and how some of that might look. But there are a lot of programs out there that are actually restorative justice and we have a full division of that here at U of M Dearborn in our criminality and criminal justice department working with uh, Dr. Paul Drouse who's in charge of sociology. He is heading up the uh, restorative justice part of this program and helping the community understand better how to bring the offenders and the victims uh, whole and be able to live back in their communities uh, where they were. You will see that there's a chart in this PowerPoint that kind of shows the differences and understanding between what we consider retributive justice and restorative justice. Um, for example, like the first part of it here, it says, you know, the crime is an act against the state, a violation of law, or an abstract idea. So the reason that the prosecutor represents the state versus the actual victim is because we believe for retribution in our society as a whole. So obviously all the court cases are the state versus so-and-so. Whereas if we were to put it more on a personal level and really make our justice system what it is supposed to be and a way to actually help the victim, we would actually say that the prosecutor is the attorney representing, representing the person who the crime was committed against and holding the offender accountable. So you can kind of look through the chart here and see how the subtle differences of wording alone would help balance out our criminal justice system even better. And not only would the victim have more say and possibly be taken care of better, but the offender would be more likely to get an idea of exactly how they have harmed this person and the real consequences of their actions to somebody else. Not just the fact that they got locked up, but the consequences of what they have caused that person to go through that they harmed. So restorative justice has a lot more depth to it and definitely uh, should be a bigger goal than what we do already in our society. So that is an overall view of the goals of sentencing. In the second part of this lecture, I am going to go through the types of sentencing. So as you can see, we have something called indeterminate sentencing. This is definitely not something we have much of anymore. We are definitely moving on from this Indeterminate sentencing was just that. You don't know necessarily how long you're going to go to jail. You might have, or excuse me, prison. You might have a minimum amount of time, but the judge had the discretion on how much more time they could give you at the far end of that. So the law may say, well, you've got at least three years behind bars. And the judge could say up to 
20 years. And it would, a lot of it determines on and is based on a parole board and their discretion as to when they want to let you out. And the other part of that would be exactly on, um, on the judge's discretion. How long do they think that that crime should be punished for? And it was really an unfair practice. So our society has moved on more to what we call structured sentencing. And that has been a little better, but not great. Uh, until the 70s, all states used some form of what we called indeterminate sentencing that we just talked about. Obviously, it was unequal. So now the goal is to uh, have more proportionality, equity, and make and social debt. In other words, let's make the punishments fit the crime. That is kind of the whole point of structured sentencing. Make it fair, equal, and just. It makes sure that we are not keeping people in prison on racism and biases. So how do we look at that? Well, there's determinate sentencing, which literally is a fixed rate of time. Here's your minimum, here's your maximum, and that's all there is to it. Uh, the judges, it takes out a lot of their discretion out of the way, so we don't have to worry so much about them making personal choices because they don't like this particular defendant or they think this crime is worse than some other crime. So it takes out that type of bias. And then we also have a way for the prosecution to put recommendations in. They're voluntary, maybe advisory, what we call sentencing guidelines, and we'll talk about how that is set up here in just a few minutes. But they are allowed to give recommendations to the judges. They are not required and they are not a law of any kind. They're just simply asking for maybe a diversion or probation versus actual incapacitation. Maybe the prosecution doesn't think that this person necessarily needs to be behind bars, but has a chance to learn the lesson in society. However, we have found that this can backfire severely, as in, uh, I believe the guy's last name was Brock, and it was a rape case, and he was sentenced to probation because this judge decided that he didn't want to ruin the career of a skilled swimmer at a prestigious college based on a rape charge. I will look up the case and post that for you as well so you can see how why determinate sentencing versus a judge's discretion uh, is needed more often than not. Other circumstances, just like the case I was just explaining, uh, that might go into a sentence we have something called aggravating circumstances. So making a crime more grave. In other words, it might have been a armed robbery. But on top of that robbery on the way out, they decided to beat a person during the robbery. So maybe the bank robbery in itself was a 15-year sentence. But due to the assault that happened during the robbery for no reason, a judge may extend that sentence even longer to accommodate um, the more seriousness of what happened. There's also mitigating circumstances, which allows for a judge to possibly give a lesser sentence for maybe a crime that we feel people should normally go to prison for for a long time. The idea here is to give people a chance to maybe explain some outside circumstances uh, and for the judge to consider the best route for this person. The issue with some of the things that do happen, especially when we are looking at mitigating circumstances, 
or the aggravating circumstances is that we want to limit the judges, as we've already discussed, on being able to use too much discretion. And so now the judges um, are not required to consider any facts that were not actually proven to the jury. So if there was evidence or other facts that wasn't necessarily allowed into the court during the trial, then the judge cannot take those circumstances and put them into the sentence. That would not be uh, a fair chance for that person, even though they said it may be, well, it wasn't used to accuse them, but we should consider all of these facts to make sure that the proper sentence is handed out. It could still prejudice and bias a judge who is enacting the sentence. So therefore, we have to show that the judges cannot or and are not required to consider any outside factors, no matter what the defense or the prosecution tries to do. So part of determinate sentencing might be uh, something we call mandatory sentencing. That will include the three strikes law. And the three strikes law, which we have discussed in class before, is if you have three felonies on your record, you can get uh, 25 years to life and you have to serve at least 80% of your time. We also call that here in Michigan, truth in sentencing, which is something that we have enacted. The three strikes law has caught up a lot of people that it was not intended to. This was supposed to be to help keep violent criminals off the streets, keep them locked up longer, especially pedophiles and uh, people that are committing, committing those type of heinous crimes, really try to lock them up and keep society stay, safe much longer than what um, the original law is allowed. So now we have this life rule, which is 25 years to life, and you have to serve at least 80% of your time of those 25 years before you're eligible for parole. We have a couple things here in Michigan. One, like I said, is called truth in sentencing, which covers a lot of this. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be for a felony and it doesn't necessarily have to be for somebody who has life. However, what it is, is that we will sentence you to a certain amount of time you and you have to serve 80% of that time, no matter what it is. But then we are going to let you out on something else called mandatory parole, which we will talk about some of that when we get into uh, the last few chapters for this semester. So mandatory sentencing, we used to have this, we don't have it anymore. You can see on this slide, it says, talks about habitual offenders. We do not have that crime anymore. It used to be that if a person was arrested for the same crime over and over and over, much like prostitution and drug use, we would actually charge you with a habitual offender, meaning you're not learning your lesson, you're just constantly doing the same crime, and give you a tougher sentence and send you to prison. We no longer do that. We have a few different things that we can do when a person is sentenced. And a lot of times now we are trying to figure out a different way to handle, especially our prison population. So in the 1990s, interesting enough, uh, a lot of our crime rates started to decrease. However, due to mandatory sentencing, the three strikes law, truth in sentencing, the prison population uh, still was climbing. Even more so for females than males. Uh, right now, we average about 1% or maybe a little more uh, decreased population in the male prisons here in Michigan yearly, whereas we, uh, the female population has been on the rise about 1% a year for a while. And obviously, some of the bigger issues is the fact that we only have one female prison here in Michigan that has to house all female prisoners. And then we have several prisons throughout the state for men. 
So as the men's population decreases, facilities are closed. As the women's population increases, we don't have any expansion and we tend to have a lot of other issues that are going on inside the prison walls that makes it safe and unhealthy for the women uh, where they are at. We'll discuss more about that also in the next few chapters and some of the impending current lawsuits that the facility has at this moment uh, here in Michigan. So what do we do? Well, there's judges that have actually used their own discretion and have come up with some interesting punishments. Something called shaming, which if you have people who have not done any type of major serious crime, there's been times where, you know, people have had to wear billboards saying what their crime was and stand out on a street. <laughs> um, I see parents do this sometimes. They've had where their kid was a bully and to teach their kid a lesson, they had they were would make them wear a sign about, you know, I'm a bully and this is my punishment type of thing and have to stand outside and so that people driving by can see and try to help get in their in their kids' head that they were what they did was wrong and this is what it felt like. Other alternatives um, can be diversion programs, which we have uh, spoken about throughout the semester. Uh, maybe looking more into probation and parole versus incarceration. I'm sorry, probation versus incarceration, not parole. And looking into real real programs, real evidence-based programs that help with rehabilitation versus just recycling everybody through the revolving doors of the prisons. A lot of people are a little more afraid of programming versus actual incarceration. And the main questions, you know, obviously, do they, is there a threat to public safety? Are they really cost effective? And how do we regulate the programs? And that's where evidence-based practices come in. And we have to give programs a chance to build research and show what kind of successes they have, if any. Right now, the standard is not very high. If you have a 25% success rate for people actually rehabilitating, you're considered to be quite a good program. I personally find that not very good in my eyes, but... Uh, that is kind of where the standard is right now. And later on when I talk about my program, I mean, my goal will be obviously a much higher rate than that. I can't say that it will be because we are dealing with people and they're unpredictable no matter sometimes how much help you try to give them. What are some of the other issues that go into a sentence? Well, how do we find out? how long somebody is going to be sentenced for, or how do we get these recommendations? There's something called a pre-sentence investigation. It is a, a report that's done by a probation or a parole officer. And that person goes and sits down. They fill out a very long form with the client, and then that recommendation is given to a judge. There is a scale that they add everything up on, so all the questions have point values, and they determine... Uh, are you a high risk factor for committing another crime? Or are you somebody who has screwed up, understands what you've done, and has a chance of, after this, you're gonna be on the straight and narrow? What are some of the high risk factors? You can see, obviously, if you have some uh, mental health issues, so antisocial, like pro criminal, I guess if you have zero remorse and you're okay with what you did. You know, are you social supports for crime? So do you belong to a gang? Are you around a lot of people that encourage this behavior? Substance abuse, uh, that obviously is always somewhat of a factor for most people, whether they're really wanting to change or not. Family and marital problems, school or work performance. These are things that cause people to commit crimes in the first place. And so if you're going back to that environment, obviously you're going to be at a high risk to uh, not rehabilitate and continue your criminal behavior. So there's a lot of different factors that we consider to determine 
who should be incarcerated and who might be able to get a, a program. Something else that we have to look at as well, and we talked about this briefly, which is restoration part of the sentencing, which is the victim. Uh, we, it's taken us a long time to get where we can actually allow for the victims to be a part of the process. And we talked about this right before we went online where the victims have had not much of a whole lot to say in the court. We have finally just gotten to where we allow the victim impact statements to take place, where we allow uh, the victims to come in and speak their mind on the sentencing to make pleas to the judges and to really have an impact in the courtroom to hopefully let the offender understand exactly what they've done. I'm going to be posting some videos of somebody who has a victim offender program and uh, give you uh, listen to her story. It's a friend of mine uh, who actually does work in the prison systems now in Ohio. Her name is Lorraine Huberry. I will post some of her videos and her story online for you to watch and uh, understand how the restoration process might work. And then I will also post, if you're interested in anything, uh, she just wrote a book about a year ago called uh, Heal My Wounds, Leave My Scars, and it gives you a more in-depth look at her walk, um, just briefly, I'll give you a very quick synopsis. Her story, uh, she, her daughter was murdered by a classmate who was stalking her. And her other daughter uh, was also attacked and left for dead. And I'm just going to give you that brief explanation because uh, you'll be able to watch her story and hear everything that happened. And it might give you quite an interesting view on some of the other issues we need to change in our criminal justice system. So as I talked about victim impact statements, um, somebody can get up and speak. It may be done by a video. Uh, and a lot of times it's done during uh, right before sentencing. The last part of this that I'm going to talk about is going to be your original traditional sentences, many times what you hear, a lot of stuff that I've talked about in class. So fines, um, there are court fines, there are uh, legal fees that happen, restitution, victim offender fee. Uh, so restitution and some of the court stuff, what happens is um, the monies get paid to the court and it goes into a fund for the victims. It's supposed to help the victim get resources and things that they need. Probation can be an actual sentence. It does not have to come after being incarcerated. There's imprisonment, which we already know. Obviously, you go behind bars. So the last part of sentencing is death, which we are going to have a live conversation about. I will email you to let you know the date and time for that class conversation. I want everyone to join in that. That is usually one of the more interesting topics. And you will also have a video to watch for that as well. So uh, those are the main types of sentences. Fines, um, just to kind of look into a little bit different. So a lot of people do not like fines. They believe that it is an unfair practice. And from my experiences working in the community uh, corrections part of where the correctional system now, so all the alcohol and drug testing that I do is part of what we call community corrections. They have to pay for absolutely everything. Probation is not free. You have to pay for your probation officer. You have to pay a fee for every class that you take. You have to pay a fee for every drug and alcohol test you take. And for many people, they have no money to contend with all of these fees. So 
part of our problem, and again, I will talk a lot about this when we get into corrections, is the fact that it is built for people to fail. And many people fail because it's impossible for them to pay all of this kind of money. They didn't have a job to start with, which is probably, possibly, not probably, but possibly why they robbed a store or robbed a bank or stole something. It's not just because they want to commit a crime. It may be for survival. And so to watch all these people have to come in and pay these fines and court costs. Now, I will say this. Some of the system is set up to help. So I have several people who come and help me, uh, especially right now as we are working on rebuilding this house in Detroit to do community service hours, which is usually part of their probation. And a majority of the people, as long as they finish it or a certain number of their hours at a certain amount of time, the courts actually knock off money of their fees. So I have one lady who's done, I think, a couple hundred hours and the courts knocked over $800 off of her fines and costs. So it's almost a chance to work off your money versus pay. So at least there is some uh, different some different ways for them to accomplish this task. But you're also asking them to do classes and you're asking them to do things that require transportation. Many of them cannot drive. Their licenses get suspended and they have no transportation so now they're trying to pay for an uber or a lyft and if any of you know those services are not exactly cheap uh, the bus system is unreliable half the time the buses are late or you may have to take five buses to get somewhere and it can take three or four hours this is a big issue the goal is we don't have to pay for you to be incarcerated. We don't have to uh, necessarily uh, pay so much money to supervise you, and yet using a fine is a way of still punishing someone and hopefully keeping them and deterring them, right? That specific deterrence to keep them from returning to that life of crime. It is a very uh, controversial subject and can get very um, tedious and again in many cases it is an unfair practice. So I am looking forward to our live discussion on the death penalty and this will conclude chapter 11 and I will be posting your assignment that is in place of your test along with everything else that is already online in the Canvas module called Online Week 1. Thank you.